Our next speaker uh, literally does need no introduction, but uh, I'll do it anyway. Uh, he's, of course, uh, James Edward, host of the Political Cesspool. And uh, I have watched with great interest since 2004, since uh, the Political Cesspool went on the air, as uh, James Edwards has refined and improved his show and uh, really turned into the real, genuine radio talent that he has become. It's become one of the really important sources of news and uh, opinion, dissident news and dissident opinion in the country today. I would point out that uh, no fewer than eight of the people who are speaking today have actually been on his program. That would include Frank Borslary, Alex Kurtajik, Sam Dixon, David Yeagley, Merlin Miller, who will be speaking later, Rowan Quintana, also speaking later, Richard Lynn, and myself. He has also had Philip DeWinter, Nick Griffin, Paul Gottfried, Steve Saylor, John Derbyshire, Patrick Buchanan, in short, anybody who's got anything interesting to say about anything that's important. He's done a great job. And besides being a very talented radio host, he's also the author of an acclaimed book, Racism, Schmacism, and it's my pleasure to present to you James Edwards, who will speak about a winning mindset. Well, thank you, Jared, for that uh, very generous introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at American Renaissance 2012. Uh, as everyone here knows, the American Renaissance conferences are the premier event in the cause of European American advocacy. And I'm honored to be back here among my colleagues and my friends. Uh, when drafting these remarks, I, I wanted to keep them purposefully short for a couple of reasons. Number one, let's face it, everybody came here for the fellowship that occurs in between the speakers. And so I figured uh, if I could move the par parade a little more quickly down the road, we could all get down to serious business. And that's, of course, the business that takes place during the breaks. Also, if you've never put on a conference before, you, you're lucky. <laughs> it's very hard to do, and uh, one of the things that happens is that they never run on time, and I thought I would do Jared a favor by shortening mine just a little bit so we could make up a little time, and then I'll be damned if this isn't the first conference I've ever gone to that is not only on time, Jared is running it literally to the minute. Everything has hit right on time, uh, but anyway, we'll do the best we can and hopefully take a few questions. Uh, another thing I want to tell you is that uh, I'm sure, or at least I hope, that no one came here expecting uh, one of the speakers to be able to deliver a silver bullet, that you were going to come here and someone was going to write the prescription uh, that would cure all of the ails that America suffers from and that we would be able to go out and implement them next week even and everything would uh, start to fall back into place. Now, those are unrealistic expectations, but uh, what I have done was prepare a few remarks that I hope will relate to you what I've been able to do that works uh, and uh, offer a few practical matters of advice that certainly we can all apply in our daily lives. Uh, when Jared approached me last year about speaking here today, he suggested that I talk about what I've been able to do that appeals to the mainstream and about how I'm able to stay positive and professional while at the same time coming off as a relatively normal guy. And a lot can be said for normalcy these days. Let's face it, and I'm of course not talking about anyone in this room, but from time to time as you run in these circles, whether you call it the race realist movement or the white nationalist movement, you will run into people that are a little weird. And I don't know if that's, uh, you know, it could be some people that are overly intellectual and uh, therefore a little socially awkward or just people that are, that are angry and bitter. And I'm neither. I'm not particularly intellectual and I'm always in a good mood for whatever reason. And so, uh, you know, I'm often called positive uh, by many folks who talk with me and email with me. And I take that as the high compliment that people intend it to be. Uh, God knows I've been called a lot worse than positive and normal. But uh, despite the odds that we face, and listen, you know, I have no illusions about what our current situation is, uh, I still operate under a very sunny disposition. Uh, I think it stems from the spiritual affirmation 
that comes from doing one's duty. Jared talked about duty, and I want to be sure to make a point of, of speaking on it as well. Uh, I'm happy to do mine in the best way that I can. When I'm asked what, what it is that we've done that's made our work on the radio so popular, I, I, I fear that I'll find myself in the same position as the, the centipede who was asked by the grasshopper how he kept all of his feet synchronized. Uh, the, the centipede thought about the question for a moment, and then he could never walk again. And I think that uh, an analysis, <laughs> an assessment of our work might uh, result in a similar paralysis. But I'm proud to say, I'm happy to say, that for whatever reason, and for whatever number of reasons that there are, uh, the political cesspool has uh, acquired a large audience, and it's growing. Uh, we've been on the AM and FM airwaves. I mean, uh, I'm sure most of the people here, I hope most of the people here are familiar with, with our work, but it's not an internet broadcast. Even though we do have a, an online simulcast that brings in people who aren't in our local markets, we are an AM and FM syndicated radio show uh, that's in different markets across the country. We have two stations in Memphis, which is uh, our base. And my work on the, the radio during the eight years that I've, I've been on has been covered by over 150 newspapers, magazines, and television programs that have helped us develop a reputation that I wouldn't trade. Now, not one of those 150 newspapers, magazines, and television programs have ever uh, reported honestly about our work, <laughs> but the publicity that they've given us um, does bring in the curious observer, and from time to time you'll run into people who have brains that work, and they're able to come in, take a look at you for themselves, and make their own conclusion, draw their own conclusions about what you're doing. And uh, when we have those objective uh, folks come and take a look at us as a result of the publicity we've, we've garnered, many of them make the decision to stick around and support us, and that's how we've been able to grow. Some people tell me that they're amazed that a Memphis-based radio show like mine is able to survive at all. Uh, and they're right. It, it is amazing. We're a pro-white broadcast with a flagship station in a city that has a black-to-white ratio of over two to one. And Memphis uh, is now unquestionably one of the most white-hating places in America. And that might explain why we've had so much success in Memphis and why we have been able to grow out of our home base. It's because we're the only media for white people in that city. And with charisma and panache, we present our case uh, to the everyday man on the street that we're going to have to enlist in this struggle if we're ever going to make serious strides in the reclamation of America's destiny. Um, and we don't do it alone, as Jared mentioned. You know, this, certainly the success of the show, first of all, goes to the audience. Uh, and, and beyond that, it goes to the incredible guests that we've been able to feature over the years. People like Jared Taylor and Pat Buchanan, Kevin McDonald, Richard Spencer, Frank Borzellari, I mean, so many others. I mean, thousands of shows we've done and uh, too many guests to mention, but a lot of them are in this room today. You put it all together and it seems to be working. Uh, we're able to make, to the extent that we can, uh, our issues somewhat fashionable again. Because the general public, as you know, they're not going to back something that isn't in vogue. You have to be a trendsetter. You have to make things trendy again. And, Again, we don't have a, an audience that would make Rush Limbaugh jealous, but we do have an audience large enough to, to, to see some tangible changes. And, and I think that the audience would agree that we're able to make these things fashionable again, and it gives them the, the courage and, uh, to, to move forward and do it themselves. Uh, I can remember in the early days, just to, to prove the point, uh, I can remember back in the early days, back in 2004, 2005, when we first uh, got on the air, uh, one of my co-hosts, Winston, and I would, would conduct from time to time what we called the waiting in line market research. And w it was actually Winston that would do it, and he would always do it um, to my embarrassment. But when we would stand in line at a store or as we sat together at a busy diner, uh, he would talk about the show. And he would talk about it, you know, keep in mind, this was in the early days, and this was this radio, not television, so we didn't have a problem back then of being recognized. But he would talk about the show, and he would do it, he would do it loudly enough that people in the immediate area would hear him. And then he would turn to them and ask, what do you think about those guys? Have you ever heard those guys? And more often than not, and this is the truth, not only would the random bystander be familiar with the program, but they would share a favorable opinion of our work. And again, these were the same kinds of people that we have to draw, the, the roofers with mortgages. And they're the same types of people who helped us chase Al Sharpton out of town. In 2006, when he was there to 
uh, helped lead the charge to rename three Confederate parks in the city of Memphis. Uh, no one else would stand up, no one else would speak up and speak out for uh, the defense of our cultural heritage there, and so we did. And through the radio program, through our uh, ability to, to reach the people through that forum, uh, we ended up drawing a counter-protest, we called it a vigil, and more people showed up to our vigil uh, than did his um, event. And uh, he, uh, as a result of the people there, he, he canceled his, his proposed march, and to our knowledge, it's one of the only times that ever happened. And, and those people that were there with us that day in 2006, standing uh, with us against Al Sharpton, I, I think those are the same kinds of people who, who hold the key to effective white advocacy. I, I firmly believe that most European Americans, particularly those in the red states, I think they still to this day fundamentally agree with us on, on these certain taboo issues. Uh, everybody, I think, is probably familiar with a, a recent poll that was conducted during the Mississippi Republican primary last week. And it's, in the poll, the results showed that uh, apparently 30% of the registered voters of Mississippi still believe, with righteous indignation, that interracial marriage should be outlawed. That's 30% of the people who were honest enough to answer the question, knowing that the pollster had their name, number, address, et cetera, et cetera, 30 percent. I think that the actual number would, would be much, much greater than 50. Uh, but, but things like this you run in from time to time, and, and it, it helps foster a sense of hope. And I'm in a unique position as, as host of a radio program in which I'm fortunate enough to receive dozens of letters and emails every week from people all around the world who affirm my assessment. And I don't think that it's naive to trust that most European Americans know what's wrong with this country. And they know the real problems that we face on, on uh, the racial issue. But they don't know what it is that they can do about it. Indeed, they don't know if there's anything they can do about it. For most of us, life is burdensome. We have families that we have to support. And we work our jobs to support them. We have to work to support those who won't work. We have homes to maintain. We have children to raise. We have spouses who need and deserve our attention. And a hundred other cares and concerns that prevent us from marching in mass when legislators pass laws that work to decrease the influence of the dispossessed majority. And naturally, we're too civilized and too law-abiding to start riots when a white girl is kidnapped, raped and tortured and murdered by a gang of diversities. This happened in Knoxville, Tennessee a few years ago and I had the opportunity to speak about that on national television. But we don't do that. Besides, we're at the point in which it's financially dangerous, as you just heard, uh, for, for us to speak out on behalf of our people. I mean, just ask Pat Buchanan, Frank Borzellari, and Jared Taylor. They'll tell you. These folks and so many others have been victims of what I call economic terrorism at the urging of people who hate white people. And for the average workaday white person, it's a huge intimidation factor. They think if, if these guys can be fired for speaking frankly about racial issues, then so can I. So for most European Americans, visible activism and advocacy is absolutely out of the question for now. But still they want to do something on behalf of our people. Now, pardon me for stating the obvious, but other races have advocacy and pressure groups. They're everywhere. They're visible, their belligerence is applauded and encouraged, they're well-funded, and they're entrenched. But groups that work on behalf of the interests of European Americans are just plain scarce. It's not difficult for what few of us there are to get exposure, but national media coverage that accurately portrays our views and activities is a dream. There's no money in this movement. As I mentioned, uh, we've been operating for nearly a decade now and have enjoyed more celebrity than most, but we still have a razor-thin operating budget. As organizations, we're constantly fighting for our basic rights to exist and to operate. This very conference has been shut down twice because hateful and dishonest people don't want us to exist. They don't want our work and our words to exist. And if it were not for the fierce determination of Jared and his staff, None of us would be here today. When polite and racially aware folks think of the individual and the organizational leaders 
of white advocacy, you'd be lucky to employ all of your fingers and toes. We're fighting a difficult uphill battle. And the hill is very steep and very slippery. If advocating for European Americans was simply a matter of common sense and truth and powerful communication, then our side would have won the battle a long time ago. I look out over this crowd today, and to say the least, I see the deepest thinkers, the most honest and clear-sighted observers, and the most eloquent and elegant communicators. But it pains me to say that it is just not enough. Those among us who are in the public eye, those among us who are able to communicate with power and style, and those among us who are allowed to make the occasional Viking raid into the establishment media, we're too few, and then the, the available forms that present themselves to us are always hostile. If we're going to advocate for white people, then we're not going to get help from the media or the government. We all know that. And I don't mean to say that we shouldn't try to get time in front of TV cameras and behind radio microphones, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't lobby and pressure our politicians. Certainly we should. We should pursue aggressively any and all avenues to answer our critics, to spread our message, and to legislate our principles. Uh, but furthermore, I think that we need to rethink and refocus our efforts, which for too long have consisted mainly of making a display of the shameful and shameless behavior of the so-called minorities and exposing the Machiavellian connivings of so-called dual citizens. Those efforts have served an important function, to be sure, and thanks to them, no one can doubt or deny that the typical outrageous, barbaric, and, and violent third world cultures are incompatible with European American culture. As I once had the opportunity to say, again on CNN, you cannot have a first world nation with a third world population. We're very good at observing and analyzing these things, but it seems that the final punctuation, especially of our postings and comments and discussions online, ends with the effect of, it's disgusting, it's awful, it's unacceptable, and that's the end of it. Uh, our readers and listeners go away with raised blood pressure, and I fear a more acute sense of powerlessness. Well, Jared asked me here to, to talk about a winning mindset for, for white advocacy, and how that mindset intersects with my work on uh, the radio airwaves. <sighs> Winning white advocacy begins at home. And let me first remind you of something that we should never forget, and that is, and Sam Dixon has spoken about this before, and it's, it's very, very true, how important it is for us to have heroes, real heroes, and to, to emulate them in the best way that we can. When speaking of heroes, I certainly have mine, too many to mention, but being from the South, and more specifically, hailing from right here in Tennessee, I tend to gravitate first toward the heroes who have called my state their home. People like Andrew Jackson, who won the Battle of New Orleans and went on to kill the bank. Davy Crockett, a man who left Congress to face overwhelming odds and certain death in defense of his people at the Alamo. And Nathan Bedford Forrest, a wealthy businessman at the time who volunteered for service in the Confederate Army as a soldier of the lowest rank, and then, with no military training, rose to become one of the greatest tacticians in the history of warfare. What happened to the race that used to produce men like that? Well, we got fat and lazy. And we decided that even though the sacrifices we may have to suffer in terms of unfair character assassination and defamation, and even though those sacrifices pale in comparison to the sacrifices that those men and so many others made in order to give us this country and our freedoms, we'd rather piss that inheritance away than be called the R word. And I wrote a book about that. As a race, despite having the truth on our side, despite knowing these truths, we've accepted and become guilt-ridden over the grievances that non-whites pretend to have without demanding their gratitude for all of the immeasurable contributions that European mankind has given to the world, contributions in science and medicine that benefit all of humanity. If you put 
whatever they could be upset about on one end of the scale, and the contributions that European mankind has given to everyone on the other, it's no contest whatsoever. But the good news is that the same genes that animated men like Jackson and Forrest and Crockett and so many others are still there within all of us, They're lying dormant there, just, just waiting to be, to be stimulated. And I'm not suggesting that it's possible for me or any one of you to go out there and accomplish feats on par with those men I just, just mentioned and those men that I just used as examples, but you don't have to do those types of superhuman things to be a hero. We can all be a hero in our own homes. And I'm speaking specifically to, to the men in this audience. I mean, all of these meetings are uh, <laughs> more men than women, but uh, as a man and, and to a man, be a hero by, by being a good husband and a, a strong light in your home, being a good, a good father and a good brother and a good son walk with your shoulders squared and greet people with a firm handshake and look them in the eye and when asked you of your opinion, tell them the truth and tell them the truth in love. You know your, your, your situation at home and in your community better than I, so find the way to best apply yourselves. What one man can do, another can do. And, and I'm trying to apply myself on the radio because that was the opportunity that presented itself to me. And I'll say this, our show... Certainly we cover the news, and a lot of it's very upsetting. But ultimately, I'd like to think that our show is about empowering our listeners. We want to give them information, but we also want to encourage them. We want to point out to them uh, the doors of opportunity that they can find. And the, our show is about the audience. It's about our people, and it, it's worked. It is working. Uh, time and time again, again, I, I, I'm in this position a very fortunate position where I'm able to receive a lot of feedback, feedback that uh, a lot of people uh, wouldn't be privy to unless they're, they're in a position uh, to where they have an audience. And we get these emails and we get these snail mails from, from folks, both here in America and indeed all around the world, telling us that how through our work and through our efforts, they've been inspired to, to run for local office, to, to go to law school, to throw away their television sets, uh, to pull their kids out of public school and to homeschool them to get married and have kids and teach them to love their race, each and every one of those things are heroic acts and acts of effective white advocacy. This is heroism. Be a hero to your family, both your immediate family and to your extended family. And always remember that our race is our extended family. When white people love their race, when white people get engaged, we can be a pretty effective bunch. Uh, I told you about how the white people of Memphis and Al Sharpton uh, packing and I was happy to play a role in that. In 2007, we all re recall, I think, the, the Senate at that time was, was posed to approve George W. Bush's Comprehensive Immigration Reform Act, an amnesty bill that included a one block long road to citizenship for the millions of illegal aliens in our midst. But the day before the vote, ordinary people, ordinary European Americans, just like the ones that make my audience, they melted down the Senate phone bank. Just this week, we're seeing advertisers begin to bail out of the primetime ABC TV show, Good Christian Bitches. The advertisers are leaving because white people are taking quiet action, implicitly pro-white action, by calling and complaining and getting engaged in the process. And you can bet that the people calling the advertisers of ABC are white because that's a show that depicts uh, and demeans and humiliates European Americans, and a show like that would never be opposed by non-whites. Quite the opposite, in fact. As I said earlier, the, the, the task of white advocacy is too big for just those who are considered to be the leaders or the, the guiding lights of this movement. And cataloging the outrages against white people isn't enough. Most European Americans, including the self-proclaimed liberals, who live in their gated suburban enclaves know just how bad multiculturalism really is. But they think that by embracing it or pretending to embrace it and by adopting non-white children that they will improve their, their social standing. And, and to whites, this is an affliction. I mean, we would rather, um, we would rather have a high social status with the people that, that don't matter uh, than then do what's good for, for our kind. And we have to make this, uh, we have to 
make sure that the exact opposite is in fact what happens, that they diminish their, their social standing by engaging in acts such as this. Um, but anyway, they know, I think deep down inside, what multiculturalism is all about. We've done a great job of making sure they know it. Everybody in this room has done a job of doing that. Nature has done us one better. But, uh, you know, and even the most outspoken detractors display the self-consciousness that they have in their own arguments when they issue, and I'm speaking about the SPLC, for instance, the ADL, when they issue these relentless and hysterical attacks against people like me and Jared and others, if, if our thinking was so obviously wrong and so transparently ignorant, then what's their worry? They know we're right. Even they know that we're right. But getting back to the point, we need to tell our people, always remind them how good they are, how good we are, and that they must take on the task of white advocacy. They are the best advocates, and we need them to know that contending for and loving our race is a generational endeavor. For loving our race is the winning mindset for effective white advocacy. So I encourage everyone to go home and tell the truth in love, do your duty, and for God's sake, I know everybody here paid a nominal conference registration fee in order to, to share this delightful company. But nobody should leave this room without making another financial contribution to American Renaissance, to Frank Borzileri, to the other organizations that are here and the individuals in this room who are doing good work. Uh, in fact, I'll go one further. I know there's nothing as distasteful as asking for money, but let's, let's be real here. If anyone leaves here with a dollar in their pocket, they should be ashamed. There are, the true leadership of white advocacy is in this room. They need your support. They deserve your support. Find them. Help them. That is all. Thank you all. Well, listen, that's the classic double standard. The liberals have no shame, no integrity, no, no honesty. You would think that uh, such a jaw-dropping double standard would, would, would occur to them. But yes, I mean, you know, there is no reason except for the fact that they hate us and they, they seek our dispossession. And so even though it's, it's to anybody with, with a mind that works, you look at that and you say, something's, something's wrong there. I mean, why, why is it evil when whites do what everyone else is encouraged to do? And of course, the, the fact of the matter is it isn't, and, and we have to overlook these, uh, these silly attacks and the baseless name-calling and go about and do our work. Yes. Uh, do you think stations like yours have a chance to success outside the uh, South, and if so, in what other regions would they be most likely to uh, survive and prosper? Well, any, any region where there's a, a high uh, demographic of non-whites, I think that would be the first place. But no, I mean, we're, we, have, uh, we have stations in, in, you know, from Florida to Oregon and, and different ports of call in between. And, um, you know, we, we've done well everywhere, everywhere we have been. And uh, thankfully, I have the support of station management and network ownership that, you know, they don't seem to care any time uh, uh, you know, people call in and try to try to you know, scare them or get them to take us off the air. We, we have a great working relationship. They know certainly what our show is about and what it's not about. And so when you, you get these frivolous and asinine attacks, uh, they've, they've been supportive. And anywhere we've been, truly anywhere we've been, um, the, show's, the show's gone over well. Ready for the next one? Sure. Mr. Obama has a massive obvious, glaring vulnerability that everyone with a pulse knows about, but of which no politicians will speak. Rush won't talk about it. Sean won't talk about it. You probably can guess what it is. Which, it, which one? <laughs> there's only one that's, that stands out above all the others. And that is his obviously fake birth certificate. Now, the birth certificate is a fake. That is, I hear some people saying, no, 
they haven't looked at it. It is obviously a fake, and nobody will attack him on that point. Why is that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, I think most people would, would, would see that as unbelievable, even though I think there is uh, some credence to the argument. We've actually covered this story on the show. I think it certainly deserves a good look. Uh, a lot of the actions that the administration uh, had taken for, for several years were very suspicious. I, I do believe, though, and you might know better than me, I do believe this is going to come to a head in Arizona. I believe in Arizona this is actually going to go before a court. Well, Sheriff Joe out there has uh, said that there's probable cause to believe that the birth certificate is a forgery, and based on that, he's launching a, a criminal investigation. You know, the way I see it, though, and, and, and hopefully something will come from that. I mean, we'll see. It's unlikely, but whether or not his birth certificate is legitimate, he still is woefully unqualified to be the president of the United States for any number of reasons. And so, uh, you know, that's just... I think the birth certificate deals the cherry on top of the cake, but the, the fact that this country could even consider him to be presidential material shows how so, uh, far we've fallen. Well, but this is a fundamental... Okay. This is a fundamental... Uh, I'd, like to get an, I'd like to get an answer. I'd like to get, you know... Uh, uh, an answer on that. I'd like, okay. I'd like thanks, for, I'd like for a court to look at it and vet all the information and, and let people know one way or the other. But to me, you I mean... You want me to shut up, Jared? <laughs> if his birth certificate was That's real, That's a nice way of saying shut up. Thank you. <laughs> it wouldn't change my mind about it. I'm uh, quite aware of your show, but I've never actually listened. So I don't know who your advertisers are, and I'm wondering, do you actually have a coterie of companies who are not craven and, uh, and yeah, not I mean, craven over time? No, I don't. Uh, let me, this, uh, when we first got um, uh, added to the hate watch list in 2006, we had legitimate advertisers. Uh, we had local car dealerships. We had uh, various businesses in the local community. And uh, once, once it came out that the SPLC had designated us a hate group, uh, obviously, the local uh, network affiliates in Memphis ran with the story. And then there was a above-the-fold front-page feature story in the Sunday newspaper uh, later that week. Uh, and the enterprising black female reporter who wrote that story made a point to go to our website and contact each and every one of our advertisers to, to ask them if they knew whether or not they were supporting uh, racist hate radio. And uh, since then, Council of Conservative Citizens, American Third Position, we, we do business in-house. No, we, can't, we cannot uh, attract uh, commercial sponsorship. We are a listener-supported entity. Without the support and donations of uh, the audience, we, we, don't, we don't exist. And for eight years, the audience has, has kept us sustained. I mean, we meet the budget. It's a lean budget. Uh, but no, we, there's no money for us in commercial uh, advertising. Uh, James, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we can gain legitimacy in, uh, in the media. And, and certainly, I think everyone uh, would agree that the internet has been a gift from the gods for all of us uh, in the sense of you, you don't have to keep your head down and maybe work at a newspaper and fit something in every six months or something. You can, you can really write what you want, have blogs. We, we do have a lot of successful websites. But then, obviously, the you know, still, at the, at the end of the day, Time Magazine, Rush Limbaugh, big, big stuff like this, they have a little more legitimacy. I mean, maybe you can just talk about navigating those two things. Well, certainly if I knew how we could gain more legitimacy, I'd do it, and I would tell everyone else the, the, the secret. I mean, I, I was just very lucky to have followed a broken road of political a broken road of political activism that led me in, into radio, and it just so happened to be on the, you know, legitimate uh, AM, FM airwaves. We, we wouldn't be where we were without the Internet audience and those who, who listen to our stream. Uh, but no, I think it's important. People don't believe what you have to say. It, it, it is incredible unless they read it, and even though the industry is dying, unless they read it in the, on the, daily, in the daily newspapers, unless they see it on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, or unless it's on the AM, FM radio, it cannot be true. And to them, that's just the way it is. There's a lot more truth that can be found on the Internet than you'll ever find. And all of the newspapers in, in America combined on any given day. But unless you are in, in that form of media, people are not going to take your message seriously, at least the kind of people uh, that we have to uh, reach out to and, and bring in. And so I, I guess you know, we're able to serve as a, as a gatekeeper in that way. We have the legitimacy that AM, FM radio offers. And then uh, if, if that's enough to get people in the door, we will lead them 
We will lead them to you, Richard. Hi. By way of introduction, I'd like to tell you that I am one of the plaintiffs in a lawsuit against Barack Hussein Obama, proving, requiring him to prove that he is a natural born citizen. Our case was the only one, our case was the only one to actually make it to the Supreme Court in a writ of certiorari which was summarily dismissed by the Supreme Court. I want to agree with the gentleman here that that recent long form birth certificate is a fake. It's been altered. Even you can determine that for yourself looking at it. Look for the race of his father. It is listed as African. I don't think even today, but certainly not in 1961, was African ever listed on any U.S. birth certificate as a race. He was either Negro or colored. The other thing is, we need to continue to pursue this. It is the way to get him out. Not only is he, has he not provided a true birth certificate, but the requirement constitutionally for a natural born citizen is that he not only be born in this country, but of two citizen parents, and we know that his father was never a citizen of this country. I just wanted to follow up. You know, you know listen, again, people seem to want to talk about that. I'm skeptical about it myself, and we, we've covered this on the radio. In fact, we covered it in a very big way. They made very big news a couple of years ago. We had the former uh, elections clerk in the state of Hawaii at the time when, when Obama was running, and he said it was just common knowledge that, uh, that he did not have a birth certificate. Now, again, I'd like for that to be, to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, but even if it is, what do you expect him to do? You got me? You know, he's going to leave? They, you know, they, this is the American government. They break rules all the time. They don't, they don't operate by the same set of laws that they expect us to follow. I mean, I, I, they don't surrender power. You know, these guys, they don't surrender power. Uh, I don't think, he, I, I just couldn't see the day. Even, even if a court of law ruled the birth certificate uh, as a fraud where Barack would say, all right, guys, well, it's been fun. I'm going to step down. They do not do that. I mean, we know they don't do that. So anyway, we'll see how that plays out. I hope it happens. Don't get me wrong. All right, everybody. We'll see you around.